Have ten. Mm-hmm. Senator Sobers. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Well, I definitely won't be, be long again at all. Um, there was one other concern in terms of my conversation with some members of the be- one or two members of the bench, and I would have spoken to Senator Hussein about it as well, and he cleared it up, was whether or not um, judges who, for whatever reason, decided to retire at 65, I think the Honorable Attorney General would give his position on that as well too. Um, if they decide to leave at 65, if they would still be entitled to their pensions as opposed to going to the full round of 70, I think there's legislation on that. Um, I think Senator Hussein was indicating that once they serve their 15 years, right, and I would definitely <coughs> give way to the AG because um, there was a question that I asked him on the floor and it would be nice if he could indicate that to the House. Um, you know, we are considering um, allowing for the widening of infra- well, manpower and the infrastructure within the system, and we consider judges now, but the AG would have indicated that there are many other pivotal individuals who actively participate within the justice system in terms of magistrates and masters and whatnot. And they are not included here in terms of extending their retirement age. And some of them do a lot of human service, especially with respect to the cons- the, the environments that they, they exist in. And I would wanted, I wanted to, to inquire as to why not magistrates and masters, if you. <coughs> Thank the honorable. Senator, for the question, which is an excellent question. The position with respect to magistrates and masters, there are two hurdles that we're juggling. One is the law association's view on magistrates and masters and the age of qualification, five years and seven years call in the first instance. Two is the method by which they are born, i.e. creatures of statute. I can say that right now I have drafted a full magisterial protection bill where I will move magistrates from partial protection to full immunity a la judge, giving them proper immunity at that end, equivalent to what we see in the protection of registrars. We're looking at the issue. We have to have consultation across the board right now with the magistracy in particular. And so we have a question mark on that one. It's the intention to treat with issues, but I have to have clarity on that. First step, therefore, in summary, give them full immunity. Second step complete the discussions with the law association and the magistracy itself with respect to the age of of that aspect and the effect on the public service. Thank you, A.G. Because the the thing is, um, that very same um, magistrate that that I indicated earlier on in my contribution, who I um, would have appeared before as a magistrate and now um, standing side by side before the bar, I mean, in terms of my discussions with him, he indicated he still had many years inside of him to go, to assist, and he sees his former um, brothers and sisters on the bench still struggling with respect to the system that we have, and he he continuously shares their pain. So I'm glad that we are actually actively considering their position. Um, All in all, in summary, again, it is a bill that I think um, is well intended um, in terms of addressing um, the issues with respect to what causes our the members of the judiciary to leave and, and, and placing systems in place to tether them and anchor them to Trinidad and Tobago so they could advance our jurisprudence. The public at large will augur well from such a, um, a measure. Um, but again, I just want to urge the government that they must address or at least um, uh, address the issues with respect to operationalizing some of these, 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 leg- these pieces of legislation. We can't let our ambitions run away from us and not manage it properly with respect to actively um, amending and fixing um, infrastructure and systems. When we call upon persons to to actively participate, they must have the the infrastructure in place to do so and do so efficiently, or else we will be spinning top in mud and we will be failing. Mr. Vice President, with those few words, I thank you. Senator Vera. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, Clause 3 is uncontroversial. It seeks to amend Section 63 of the Interpretation Act. Section 63 of the Interpretation Act says, where a written law confers a power to make any statutory instrument 
there may be a next to a breach of that statutory instrument, a punishment by way of a fine not exceeding $500. Translating that into simple English, it means that where a regulation is breached and no penalty is specified, the fine is $500. Now, $500 is nothing in today's world. It doesn't even constitute a, slap on, a hard slap on the wrist, and it's certainly not a deterrent. Clause 4 similarly poses no difficulty. It says two things. First, it's simply defining masters of the High Court, the Chief Magistrate, the Registrar and Marshal of the High Court, and the Court Executive Administrator as Chief Judicial Officers. And secondly, it provides that the terms and conditions of the Chief Judicial Officers will be the same as our chief judicial officers, such as the DPP and chief parliamentary counsel. I don't think anybody could have difficulty with either of those provisions. Clause one, however, merits special consideration. And that is the increasing of the retirement age for judges. Now, it's been said that all lawyers never die. We just lose our appeal. I don't think the same can be said about judges. Now, one of my favorite English judges is Lord Bingham. And he writes in his book of selected essays and speeches, The Business of Judging, Art Part One, that the judge's role in a civil trial is, first of all, to decide what happened, then to identify the relevant rules or principles of law and then to apply the law to the facts as he found them. Lord Bingham notes that in practice, more often than not, there is little argument on the law. The real argument is between the parties about the facts and then what orders he should make. The real challenging aspect for judges is about how to exercise their discretion. Now, in differentiating the role of judges in determining what happened in the past from, say, historians, auditors, and accident investigators, who from time to time are called upon to perform similar functions, Lord Bingham recognizes three unique features. First, judges are always presented with conflicting versions of the events in question. Secondly, the judge's determination takes place subject to the formalities and restraints attendant upon proceedings in court, such as rules of evidence, rules of procedure, pleadings, and so on. And thirdly, uh, the judge's determination has a practical effect, a direct effect, on people's lives in terms of their pockets, activities, or reputations. So the takeaway point is that our judges must be sober, reflective, and mature. The Woolsack is not a place for hotheads or the puerile. It requires persons who, besides being versed in law, are seasoned with life experience and understanding. In a word, it requires persons who are wise a quality usually associated with age. Science now confirms that while we often think of old age as a time of mental decline, it also brings improvements to brain function. In his book, Aging Successfully, neurologist Daniel Levitin explains why, as we age, aspects of our mental capabilities decline. This is due to a plaque buildup in the brain and a reduction of neurochemicals and dopamine. There's no denying that as we get older, we experience some slowing of cognitive function. And that's why it takes someone like me a little bit longer to recall somebody's name and why I sometimes forget where I put things. But it turns out that other neurological shifts in the brain open the door for new positive things as well. For instance, as we age, the area of the brain responsible for memory, decision-making, 
and emotional responses are more emotionally balanced. Research also shows increased tendencies towards understanding, forgiveness, tolerance, and compassion. Good qualities to have in a judge. Another strength that comes with aging has to do with two important categories of intelligence. Practical intelligence and perceptual cognition. In fact, studies show that people over the age of 50 score the highest in both categories. So this means that persons 50 and over are likely to be better at judging within the framework described by Lord Bingham. 60, I'm told, is the new 40. And if that is so, then our system requires judges to retire when they may be at their best. Now, that's unfair to them, given that until recently their pensions didn't keep pace with inflation and the cost of living, and also, as we have heard from other speakers, given the prohibition against their being able to return to private practice until a passage of 10 years, a decade. But it's also a loss. It's a loss to the country who stands to lose some of our brightest and best because of an outdated system. I'm thinking of legal luminaries like my pupil master, former independent senator, former chief justice, first president of the Caribbean Court of Justice, the Honorable Michael de Labastide QC. Thankfully, because different rules apply in the Caribbean Court of Justice, we managed to hold on to some of our most beloved judges for a bit longer. But others, as you have heard, were constrained to seek employment abroad, a benefit to other jurisdictions, a benefit to certain international institutions, but at our expense. The idea of retirement at 65, that came about because of pensions. In 1881, Otto von Bismarck of Prussia invented retirement. And at that time, it was a very radical idea because back then, people worked until they died. Bismarck's experience with the military and the need to provide for wounded soldiers carried over into a desire for the state to provide and care for the disabled and the elderly. Bismarck settled on 65 as a retirement age as that was pegged to life expectancy. The calculation was that the state would carry a person for a couple of years after they stopped working, the life expectancy window being very small at that time. And the idea caught on. Today, however, events have overtaken that idea. It has overtaken those good intentions and it has overtaken related legislation. Today, people routinely live past the age where they got permission to stop working. Today, it's not uncommon for someone who retired, took early retirement at, say, 60, or retires at 65, to live well into their 80s. And that's a burden on the state of an additional 20 years. So the idea of retirement at 65 is no longer a given. And in that context, does it make good sense to require able and competent judges to retire or vacate office because of a birthday? In any event, a number of judges are part of the baby boomer generation, and we don't believe in retirement. We grew up expecting to continue working or to use our silver years as a time for pursuing hobbies, taking up new interests, mentoring, doing community service. We are, at least I would like to think, that we are a lot more adventurous, vibrant, and youthful than our grandparents were when they were our age. I won't go so far as lobbying for judges to be life peers as occurs in some jurisdictions. As you know, in the United States, judges on the Supreme Court are there for life. But even 70 may be too old, may be too soon for compulsory retirement. 
Judges should, of course, be free to retire as and when they choose to do so. But subject to good health, mandatory retirement at age 75, I think, may be more appropriate. In any event, proper judicial temperament, qualities such as patience, open-mindedness, courtesy, tact, humility, and common sense, those qualities do not diminish with age. And if the neuroscientists are right, then good judges, just like fine wine, actually may improve as they get older. I thank you. Senator Hussain. Mr. Vice President, for giving me the opportunity to join in this debate, which is a very simple piece of law with far-reaching consequences as discussed by the Attorney General, which is an act to amend the Constitution, Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judicial and Legal Service Act, Chapter 601. And Mr. Vice President, what this bill seeks to do is three things. Firstly, it is for the increase of the retirement age for judges from age 65 to age 70. It is to increase fines under the Interpretation Act Section 63, which speaks about statutory, the maximum fines that can be made under statutory instruments from the sum of $500 to $1,000 and a term of imprisonment not exceeding five years, and to adjust the terms and conditions of the court executive administrative, or the court executive administrator, among other offices. Now, Mr. Vice President, this is a very critical piece of law that we are about to pass in this parliament, having been discussed at length in the other place. Now, there's a report that was compiled by the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago. It's called the Report of the Committee on Judicial Appointments, and it's a June 2018 report. And Mr. Vice President, this report is a very important report, and I commend it to all members of the Senate to have a look at this report, because it was a report compiled that, dealed, that dealt with, sorry, issues of recruitment, selection, and appointment of judges, as well as their performance assessment, removal, termination, and generally upholding the rule of law. And this report was compiled after extensive stakeholder consultation with members of the higher and lower judiciary and also from members of the law association and senior attorneys at law, civil society organizations, and former justices of appeal and even former chief justice Justice Michael de Labastid. So you can imagine the wealth of knowledge that was compiled into one report that we have now available to us in order to discuss matters of such great importance. Now, if you see my notes on my desk right now, Mr. Vice President, you would see the Attorney General's song sheet because I came prepared to rebut what the Attorney General had to say with respect to the 146,000 cases in the magistrate court and how he intends to remove those cases. But since the Attorney General did not um, sing his song today, I will just move on from that first point of rebuttal, Mr. Vice President. Uh, now, there's just one point I would just like to correct for the record. In terms of the Attorney General um, spoke of the number of masters that were existing in 2015. And he's right that there are two masters of the court, and that is Master Sobi and Awai, and also Master Alexander. But the reason why there were only two masters at that time is because under the, the system, those two masters were really used for assessment of damages that comes after the end of determination of liability in civil matters. It is only when this government took the shift um, in terms of the abolition of the preliminary inquiries by going back to the master's um, determination of a sufficiency hearing. Then there was a requirement that we staff the judiciary with extra, with more masters in order to deal with the caseload that will come to the judiciary when cases are removed from the magistrate court and the abolition of the preliminary inquiries take place so that they can now determine whether or not a sufficient case 
has been made out for it to move towards the assizes. Now, Mr. Vice President, the first point I want to deal with that deals with clause two of the bill, which is the increase in the judge's age um, from 65 years to 70. And this comes from section 136 of the Constitution, where a judge is considered of holding a special office in Trinidad and Tobago. And we are now prescriptively amending that age of retirement as is prescribed by the Constitution, section 136.1, because we are allowed to do so from my reading of the law by an act of parliament, which is called the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act. I looked at a report that came out of the UK Parliament with respect to the same issue, because they looked at retirement ages of judges in England. And before there was no retirement age, but in 1959 by the Judicial Pension, Pensions Act, a retirement age of 75 was set. Then by the Judicial Pensions, Act, Pensions and Retirement Act 1993, that was changed to 70. And this UK Parliament committee reported and they looked at why should we adjust the retirement ages of judges. And one of the issues that they raised is that they looked at the advantages and the disadvantages. And we must also look at that here. One of the disadvantages that they look at with respect to the increase in the age of judges is that it can block upward mobility for persons who want to enter the judiciary because now you will have the judiciary saturated at one point in time, and you just have to await persons to reach the retirement age, and there will be, um, in terms of a lack of upward mobility for persons who would like to become judges. The second issue that they look at is public perception. So this is a pro that they're looking at now. And the pro that they looked at, Mr. Vice President, they're saying, no disrespect to those persons who may be a bit more senior than us, Mr. Vice President, is that they believe that judges at the lower judiciary, the ones who examine the demeanor of witnesses and the ones who have to determine facts of the cases, might be more in touch with society rather than some of the older judges. So that is what the report is saying. These are not the words of Senator Saddam Hussein. I'm reporting to off what the UK Parliament has said. And another advantage you looked at is that, and I believe many senators would have said it, is that you save the talent. Because at age 65, members of the Court of Appeal who have to now retire, we are going to be giving away that talent when we could retain them right here by increasing the age from 65 to 70. But in all, and in conclusion, what this report said is that there should not be a standardized age of retirement in the judiciary. What they're saying is that you should have different retirement ages. So for members of the lower judiciary, you have an age of 70, while members of the court of appeal and the, high, the, the, higher, courts of appeal, the higher courts allow them to retire at age 75. So this is one of the recommendations that was made by the UK Parliament when they examined this issue of retirement age. Now, Mr. Vice President, when you look at what the UK is saying, we have to put that in context in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, the report I referred to earlier on also dealt with retirement ages. And at page 52 of that report, a recommendation was made. And that recommendation was what is what we're doing now. It, it reads that the retirement age of judges should be increased to 70 years on a phased basis over a five-year period so as not to be inequitable. Phasing of the higher retirement age would be necessary in the interest of equity for incumbent judges who are closer to the existing retirement age. And they went on to give an example. And they said that the retirement for judges now between 60 and 65 could be increased to 68, and for those currently under 60, the retirement age could be set at 70. So as to fix any injustice that may be caused in terms of the age on which the judge will have to retire on the commencement of the law. They also recommend, recommended, and this is a point that Senator Sobers had made, is the debar 
debarring judges from practice from 10 years to five years. So they indicated a reduction from 10 years to five years. And also the practice of appointing senior attorneys at, as temporary judges for a period of six months and up to one year should be revived. This is to also help with the clearing of backlog of cases. And this is one of, the record, one of the reports I would have commended the Attorney General to read, because what we're doing here is just making one chip in terms of how we're going to deal with the reform of the judiciary and judges, because increasing the, the retirement age is one, but there are so many other things that we should also be addressing at the same time. And this report addresses quite a host of these factors straight from the time of recruitment to appointment to promotion. And it also emphasizes the need for transparency. Because what the report also goes on to say, Madam President, is that you are now going to have judges who serve a much longer time on the bench. Therefore, there should be increased accountability for those judges. Because like any other public officer, there are appraisals. But in this case, what the report is calling for is increased accountability, that there must be periodic performance appraisals being done on judges in terms of how they perform. And there's an article written by Dr. Terence Farrell in the Express. Uh, it's entitled Section 137.3, Get Rid of It. And he went on to talk about that judges are ordinary people. And the, 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 the job that they conduct on a daily basis comes with extreme pressure, Madam President, in terms of uh, to be fair, um, to de deliver judgments in a timely fashion, and how they must set their social lives. All of these are issues that come up, for, uh, come up for discussion when you are determining who becomes judges. And what he also said, Madam President, is that there must be some sort of reform in terms of how we deal and receive complaints from lawyers and litigants um, in terms of the conduct of matters by judges and also looking at economic, social, or political issues, Madam President. So there's also a reform that we need to conduct with respect to how judges are held accountable and how their performance are tracked over the time. And you would remember, it was recently, I believe it was last year, we passed an amendment to the Supreme Court of Judicature Act where we increased the number of judges and also we, we, we um, amended the eligibility criteria for judges not only having to come from Trinidad and Tobago but now from um, other parts of the Commonwealth. And this is a very serious issue because now you will have judges who come from different parts of the world sitting here until age 75. So again, it's very important, 70, sorry. Um, so it's very important is that we need to have the, the, the performance of these judges tracked at all times. Um, now, one thing that startled me, and with no disrespect to the Honorable Attorney General, is that when he was asked in the other place, Madam President, where did this amendment come out from? The Attorney General said it was by his research and his recommendation. Um, what I would suggest, Madam President, when we deal with matters like this in terms of an interference with the judiciary, notwithstanding it's an advantage to some judges who may think it's an advantage, there must be some level of consultation that should take place. Um, in terms of he could have met with persons who were on this judicial appointment committee in terms of how he goes forward with respect to the legislation. We are supporting the increase in the age of judges, but one of the issues we have to look at is process and procedure also, Madam President. Um, from what currently exists, I know that we are going to increase the complement of judges. We heard that the Attorney General wants to also increase the number of courtrooms that judges will have now to sit. Through the invent of the criminal division, I know the system has changed to now a docket system in the criminal courts. Now, Madam President, I asked someone this morning um, how many judges they have in the assizes in the criminal courts, and I was told that there are only seven. 
So if we are to really get serious with respect to pushing and ensuring that the wheels of justice keep turning, the amount of judges with respect to sitting on criminal matters has to increase. While we understand the, the, the workload of the civil court, civil matters tend to be disposed of at a much quicker mat manner than the criminal matters. Um, because I was just speaking to Senator Vieira, most of, some, of the civil matters are now determined through ADR. You have an increased settlement in terms of these civil matters that uh, through the invent of the civil procedure rules 1998 and it was amended over time. Senator Hussein, I am giving you a little leeway, but I want you to remember what is the, what forms the basis of the bill that is before us. It's not, it's not the entire judicial system that we are debating right now. I will give you a little leeway, but I will ask you to come back to the bill, please. I, I, I take your guidance, please, Madam President. And in terms of, just closing up this point now, we need to increase the complement of criminal judges in the judiciary as we go forward with respect to the reform of the criminal justice system. And one important point, I know you, you give me liberty, but look at where we are right now in terms of this pandemic of COVID-19 where the courts are shut down. And this also goes to the point in terms of increase of technology. So as we increase the ages of retirement of judges, we must also have constant training for these judges in the use of technology because that is extremely important. Because we could have right now, Madam President, CMCs being conducted, case management conferences at the offices of attorneys, so, and the judges also need to be aware. So Senator Hussein, let's just take it that I gave you leeway and it's now time for you to come back to the bill, please, okay? Yes, please, Madam President. Uh, <laughs> when I look also at the increase in the retirement ages of judges, we must also look at whether or not the SRC has to review other terms and conditions with the increase in the retirement age of judges. Now, I want to move on to clause number um, three in the bill, which increases fines to subsidiary like matters of regulations from $500 to $100,000. Um, earlier on, we had a debate on affirmative resolution, and most of these regulations are made by sometimes negative resolution. But this underscores the, the requirement for affirmative resolution because you can have such heavy fines being placed on certain regulations now, which is $100,000, and you also have an alternative imprisonment of five years. So it needs a bit more, pa so it's a point that underscores the earlier point that Senator Vieira made with respect to affirmative resolution legislation being subject to parliament scrutiny so that we also have that level of input in terms of the laws that are going to be passed. Now, clause four, what clause four does, Madam President, is that it looks at the office of the court executive administrator and under the Judicial and Legal Service, Legal Service Act, strangely, the court executive administrator who performs an administrative role is classified as a judicial office. That office is classified as judicial office. And that office has no power in terms of making any judicial pronouncements, but under the schedule, it was classified as a judicial office. And what the amendment seeks to do is confer on the status of the court executive administrator a chief judicial officer. Now, the attorney general indicated, and from my reading of the legislation, is that the CEA, which is the court executive administrator, will now be under the direct supervision of the chief justice. Now, there's one point I want to raise with respect to this matter is that the court executive administrator is considered as the accounting officer of the judiciary. Why are we placing that person under the direct supervision of the chief justice? For example, in a ministry, the minister is separate from the permanent secretary. The permanent secretary is the accounting officer of that ministry. And there are several, um, 
issues with respect to accounting practices that are listed in the Auditor General's report. Um, I would not go into to, to the details of them, Madam President, but if you look at the Auditor General's report, there are issues with respect to accounting, and now you're putting this person under the direct supervision of the Chief Justice. Now, the other amendment seeks to confer onto the Chief Judicial Officers the same terms and conditions as Chief Legal Officers. So therefore, the Chief Executive Administrator will now have the same conditions as the Solicitor General, the Chief Parliamentary Council, and the DPP. Um, I just want to ask the Attorney General in the winding up also, is it now that the Chief Executive Administrator, her salary will now be drawn from the Consolidated Fund, um, just like the other offices? And what is the reason that we are isolating and giving this Chief Executive Administrator Administrator office so much protection um, as compared to a permanent secretary, for example, who is in a ministry. And quite frankly, both the chief executive administrator is like a permanent secretary in a ministry. So those are the issues that I wish to raise with respect to that, um, that part of the bill, Madam President. And Madam President, before I close, because I don't intend to be long on this point also, is that when I looked at the report, there were some very nice quotes, and one that caught me especially is this. It says that, <clears throat> it's from the case Ambar against the AG 1936, Appeal Court 322, Privy Council, Trinidad and Tobago. And it says that justice is not a cloistered virtue she must be allowed to suffer the scrutiny and respectful, even though outspoken comments of ordinary man. And I think that is important, because while we may criticize sometimes what happens in the judiciary, we are criticizing so that we can be at a better place, so that reforms can be made, so that recommendations can be listened to, Madam President. And, that the, and we must always, always remember, while the judiciary is independent, it is not isolated from criticism. I thank you very much. Senator Mark. Yes. <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam President. Yeah, Madam President. This bill entitled the Miscellaneous Provisions, Age of Retirement Judges of Judges, Interpretation, and Chief Judicial Judicials, rather, Officers Bill 2019 is before us. And there are areas of the legislation that require some clarification. The law or the bill will see amendments to the Constitution prescribed Matters Act, the Interpretation Act, and the Judicial and Legal Service Act. Now, under 1361, of the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago is entrenched, we have entrenched, I should say, Madam President, <clears throat> the offices which are, which are known as special offices of the judiciary, and in this instance, judges. 
and the government is seeking to increase the age of judges under the First Amendment using what is called the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act by inserting, Madam President, a new 3A in order to justify the increase that is being proposed from 65 to 70 years. Madam President, the first area that I would like to clarify is this. When I look well, when I looked at the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, which is being amended, Madam President, there are some 23 amendments to this act, which came into existence in 1966. Starting from 1968 and ending in 2016, Madam President. And the only two powerful offices I observed under this Constitution prescribed Matters Act are the offices of the President and that of the Auditor General. I go to the schedule, Madam President, both the first and the second schedule, and I didn't see the Office of Judges, puny judges as is, nor did I see the Office of Chief Justice. So if I go to section 136.1, which deals with the retirement age of a judge and other office holders enshrined under 136. We see 65 years of age, Madam President. But when I look at schedule two, I would have thought, Madam President, that the office of judge would have been reflected in this schedule, and I'm not seeing it reflected in the schedule. So we are amending the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act to increase the retirement age of judges from 65 to 70 years, but nowhere in Schedule 2 is mention made of judges or Chief Justice. So, Madam President, I would like the Attorney General to clarify for this country how can we be prescribing an age five years more than is in the Constitution, but there are no offices identified in the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act for that to take effect? So that is an area, Madam President, requires clarification and some answers from the Attorney General. Because, Madam President, I want to let this Honorable Senate know that if, the, if Section 136 one of the Constitution is being amended, then, Madam President, the Constitution under Section 54 
says that the government needs a two-thirds majority because you have to ensure that the separation of powers between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary is sustained and maintained. And therefore, I think it's important for us to get clarification from the government as to where in the schedule after 23 amendments from 1968 right to 2016, there is an absence of the offices of puny judges. So I need clarification on that from the Attorney General. Madam President, I myself was a bit shocked because when I looked at this matter and I tried to appreciate where did this matter of increasing the age of judges came from. I realized, Madam President, that sometime in November of 2019, there was an article, Madam President, in the newspapers dated Wednesday, November the 27th, in the Trinidad Guardian, in which the Prime Minister of our country is quoted in a Monday night conversation with the Prime Minister at the Palaseco Primary Government School, indicating to Trinidad and Tobago that, and I quote, we will increase the number of judges so that more cases could be heard. And we have made the decision that judges would no longer retire at 65. We have taken the decision, I'm quoting Madam President from this article in the Garden of November 27th, to raise the age of retirement to 70. This is coming from the Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister, Madam President, in November, is telling the whole country that the cabinet has taken a decision to increase the age of retirement for judges from 65 to 70 years. Because, Madam President, this was said in November. And the bill that we have before us, Madam President, only came to this parliament in December. So the question that we have to be concerned about is whether there is some kind of situation that is existing that we need clarification on, because we are dealing here with the judges of our country, and we are dealing, Madam President, with the increasing or increasing the age of these judges from 65 to 70. So the question I want to ask the Attorney General, through you, Madam President, when he's winding up, where did this proposal to increase the age of judges from 65 to 70 came from? Did it come from the judges of this country, Madam President? Did it come from the Chief Justice? Did it come from the executive represented by the Attorney General, Madam President? Where did it come from? We need answers from the government on this question. And I'm hoping that we'll get those answers from the government, Madam President. This, and Madam President, may I say from the outset, we have no difficulty increasing 
the retirement age of judges from 65 to 70. But what we have a problem with, Madam President, is the process and the procedure involved in that exercise. That is what we'll have a problem with, Madam President. And, and, and this is why, Madam President, this issue is very critical. Madam President, I'm a former trade unionist, like my friend, Senator the Honorable Jennifer Batiste Primus. And Madam President, you will know that when you're talking about the terms and conditions of employment of an employee or a worker, an inescapable element and or component of a term and condition of employment is age or retirement. That is an inescapable element or component when you're dealing with terms and conditions of employment. So let us understand that very early, Madam President. So when you are saying, Madam President, you are increasing my retirement age from 65 to 70, it means to say I'll be getting salaries and other perquisites for the next five years. So financially, I am going to be better off. And if I'm not a judge, where all my salary, including my, my um, substantive salary, is tax-free, then I will be subject to taxation as it relates to my pension. And if my pension increases because my age of retirement has increased, my conditions of service would have been altered. And therefore, it is important for us to understand that it is an inescapable component of one's terms and conditions of employment when it comes to the question of age and retirement age, Madam President. So the question that we have to ask here, Madam President, can we in this parliament, using what is called the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, simply insert under Section 3 of this Act before us a new provision that simply, Madam President, increases the age of retirement of a judge under 136.1 of the Constitution to 70 years. Can you do that? That is a term and condition of employment. So you cannot whimsically or arbitrarily use the parliament to adjust the age of retirement from 65 to 70 years, Madam President. That, Madam President, is the responsibility of the Salaries Review Commission. And what the government has done and is doing in this parliament is bringing legislation, Madam President, to alter the terms and conditions of judges without the requisite constitutional majority. That is what the government is doing here today. And Madam President, the Attorney General in particular gave the impression today that he, when I say he, the Attorney General, that is, uh, Madam, fed up with the length of time it takes the SRC to make determination and job evaluations as it relates to terms and conditions for certain category of, of um, office holders. So you know what the Attorney General is telling us to do, Madam President? Bypass the SRC. Bypass the Salaries Review Commission. We in this parliament must have the power to set terms and conditions for judges. That is what the conclusion you have to draw, 
Madam President, on this matter. And I am saying to this Honorable Senate, the Attorney General doesn't have that power to make those changes that he is attempting to make here. And Madam President, I want to repeat, we have no problem in increasing the age of retirement of a judge from 65 to 70. But we must do it properly. We must do it procedurally correct. The process must be above board. And we must not undermine, subvert, or in any way violate the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. That is the point I wish to make here this evening, Madam President. And I have concerns, Madam President. This shortcut approach that we are taking to get at this particular age of 70 is worrisome, is worrying, is concerning. And this is why, Madam President, I have brought it to your attention. So that's, that is an area, Madam President, we are very concerned with. And I hope that the Attorney General will be able to clarify for Trinidad and Tobago this development that I have brought to your attention, Madam President. Madam President, the other area in the legislation that is before us, Madam President, deals with what is called is a section four of the bill that is before us that is amending um, what is called, Madam President, the Judicial and Legal Service Act of Trinidad and Tobago. That is what that is about. So, Madam President, what we have in section, um, Madam President, I am making the point before I go to this matter, I'm making the point to you and through you to this Honorable Senate that any changes to the age of a judge or judges in our country. Senator Mark, Madam President. I think you, please, I think you've made that point yes, and I think you, you should move yes. on to your next point. Yes. I'm saying, Madam President, the SRC has a responsibility for determining one's terms and conditions of employment. So let me go on, Madam President, with your leave. Let's go to the Judicial and Legal Service Act, Madam President. Madam President, just to consolidate what I have just indicated to your good self and this honorable house, I want to go to the Salaries Review Commission Report, 98th report of November of 2013. Madam President, the offices that we are dealing with now, because I'm not going to deal with all the offices, because under this act that we are amending today, Madam President, you will see, Madam President, that we are dealing with the following offices. Under Section 4, Madam President, all of a sudden, we have an amendment to Section 2 of the Judicial and Legal Service Act, where we are removing the term chief legal officer. And under the JLSC, it means the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Solicitor General, and the Chief Parliamentary Counsel. We are altering that, Madam President, to incorporate a new concept called Chief Judicial Officer. And Madam President, this is in Section 4 of the present bill that is before this Honorable House. And we are being, we are being told, Madam President, that the Chief Judicial Officer means a master of the High Court, the Chief Magistrate, the Registrar, and Marshal of the High Court, and, Madam President, the Court Executive Administrator. That is what we are being told in this particular amendment to this act that is before us. But, Madam President, when we look at this 
matter very closely. We see under the Judicial and Legal Service Commission Act, or Service Act, I should say, the chief legal officer are three officers under this concept. Madam President, I want to go to section 136, subsection 14. Subsection 136, subsection 14 of the Constitution says, Madam President, and I quote, sex, subsection 1 and subsection 3 to 6, Madam President, apply to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, Chief Parliamentary Counsel, and Solicitor General. Madam President, Madam President, when you go to 136 1 of the Constitution, that is where, Madam President, you have the holder, and I quote, the holder of an office to which this subsection and subsection 3 to 11 apply. In this subsection, referred to as the officer shall vacate his office on attaining the age of 65 years. That is what this section says. So, Madam President, the question that we have to ask, and I am asking the Attorney General through you, how can the Attorney General, Madam President, bring an amendment to the Constitution, or to bring an amendment, rather, to the Judicial and Legal Services, or Service Act, I should say, to bring into being something called Chief Judicial Officer and incorporate the offices of Master of the High Court, Chief Magistrate, Registrar, Marshal, High Court of the High Court, and the Court of the Executive Administrator. Madam President, you know what this amendment is telling us? We are being asked to remove three constitutionally entrenched and protected offices under our Constitution and incorporate four others, Madam President. So we now have what is called, Madam President, Chief Judicial Officers or Officers, I think Officers, ma'am. So you have three protected constitutional office or offices, and we are now adding four more. So, Madam President, the question that logically follows, and we have to ask ourselves, is the Attorney General of our country saying that these new offices that we are dealing with here under this concept in Clause 4 of the bill, are these four offices now entrenched or are now entrenched as constitutional offices under our Constitution? That is what the Attorney General will have to clarify for us this evening. So instead of three protected offices, we now have seven protected constitutional offices. Madam President, you know what logically follows here? If you go to 1361, you retire at the age of 65. This is now going to 70, Madam President. So if these office holders are now going to be incorporated under this concept called Chief Judicial Officers, Madam President, would it mean that those new offices, and I'm talking about, again, Madam President, the Master of the High Court, the Chief Magistrate, the Registrar and Marshal of the High Court, and the Court Executive Administrator, would it mean, Madam President, that these offices would now be able to retire at the age of 65 years, Madam President? Because remember, the amendment is to move a judge from 65 to 70. And we are being told that the, these new offices are now going to be increased, Madam President, from 
or to that same level of 65 years. Madam President, you know why I advise that this is a logically um, conclusion, or the, or the most logical conclusion to draw? Madam President, the master of the High Court, as I understand it, and if I'm wrong, the Attorney General will correct me. The master of the High Court retires at the age of 60 years. The registrar retires at the age of 60 years. The marshal of the High Court retires at the age of 60 years. And the, the chief, the court executive administrator, Madam President, I am not too sure. Again, I would need clarification from the Attorney General. Is the court executive administrator a contractual job or a contractual office? In other words, Madam President, is the court executive administrator on contract? And if the court executive administrator is on contract, then Madam President, that person can go at any age. You cannot, you don't have to define that here. So we need to find out because I, I have done my research on this thing, Madam President, and I understand the real holder of that office, the substantive holder of the chief executive administrator office is currently acting as a judge in the industrial court. And the office of chief of court executive administrator is a, has been suppressed. And the same office title is being used by the current holder of the office. And if that is so, Madam President, this is cause for worry. Can we have somebody carrying the same title of a public office that has been suppressed? I don't know. I'm saying that these are matters that we need to clarify. And the Attorney General needs to clarify whether the court executive administrator is a contract job. And if that person is on contract, how can you entrench that person in our constitution? You can't have a contract officer in a entrenched constitutional office. Madam President, you know what is even more alarming and more dangerous in what is being proposed here today, Madam President? Madam President, let me go to law 4B Roman 2, 1B. It states, Madam President, the terms and conditions of service of the chief judicial officer shall be equivalent to those of chief legal officers. Madam President, that is what we are being told, that everybody will not be on the same level playing field. Madam President, do you know what the DPP, the chief parliamentary council, and the Solicitor General gets as a salary, according to the SRC report, Madam President, 32,700 a month. You know how much a court executive administrator gets, Madam President? 28,700 dollars. So we are being asked, Madam President, to, to violate a, an entrenched office under our Constitution. Madam President, may I ask you to join me in looking at Section 141 of our Constitution. And 141 of our Constitution, Madam President, tells you and this Honorable Senate that the SRC shall from time to time, with the approval of the President, review the salaries and other conditions of service of not only the President, but the holders of offices referred to in Section 136, 12 to 15, members of Parliament, ministers of government, parliamentary secretaries, and the holders of such offices as may be prescribed. Madam President, when you go to the SRC report, Madam President, of 
November of 2013, the 98th report. Madam President, the Salaries Review Commission under Chapter 18 of their report, the heading is the Judicial and Legal Service. You know who the Salaries Review Commission determine salaries and terms and conditions of employment? It is the Salaries Review Commission that determines the terms and conditions, Madam President, of the following offices. The Master of the High Court on page 154, chapter 18 of the SRC report, Madam President, 98th report. They also determine the salaries and other terms and conditions for the Chief Magistrate. They determine the terms and conditions for the registrar and marshal. They determine the conditions of service and terms of the chief court administrator. So here in the SRC report, all of these offices are determined in terms of salaries and other perquisites by the Salaries Review Commission. Madam President, may I remind you that this provision, section 141, is entrenched or is enshrined, I should say, in our Constitution. The SRC is a constitutionally enshrined provision in our Constitution. And it is untidy. It is unhealthy for us, Madam President, in this Parliament. Senator Mark, you have five more minutes. Yeah. It is unhealthy. It is untidy. It is messy for this Parliament to arrogate unto itself the undermining of our Constitution. And that is what we will be doing this evening if we give the Attorney General the blanket support. This bill, Madam President, we are supporting the retirement age to 70. But we are asking the Attorney General to pull back this bill. Pull back this bill, go back to the drawing board, do your homework properly, and bring the bill, and if it requires a constitutional majority, you will get our support. Oh, Madam President, what the Attorney General ought to do is to have these matters, including the age of our judges and the new terms and conditions that he is seeking, that is the Honorable Attorney General, is seeking to impose on us through this amendment for these new office holders, Madam President. Those matter, matters ought to go back, Madam President, to the SRC and let the SRC determine the conditions and terms of employment of these office holders. Madam President, are you aware that there is a job evaluation that is taking place right now as it relates to judges and members of parliament? They, they invited me to a meeting. The, the consultants who are doing the job evaluation and they do it for all of the offices that fall under the purview of the SRC. So why is the Attorney General, Madam President, bringing legislation to this parliament for us to alter the terms and conditions of the Chief Magistrate, the Master of the High Court, the Registrar of the High Court, the Marshal of the High Court, Madam President, among other office holders, that the Honorable Attorney General is seeking to advance without doing the necessary procedural exercise that is needed. These matters of terms and conditions, whether it is age for the judges, going from 65 to 70, whether it has to do with new terms and conditions for these new office holders, that is the responsibility, Madam President, of the Salaries Review Commission, which is, which is enshrined in Section 141 of our Constitution. And therefore, Madam President, I want to appeal to the Attorney General, 
if you want to get this thing right. Because I have the Attorney General on the matter of the age going the same thing. But I'm saying to the, to the Attorney General, Madam President, the process is flawed. It is effective. It is efficient. It breaches the Constitution. And therefore, Madam President, this matter could be challenged in the courts of Trinidad and Tobago. And we want to ensure, Madam President, that whatever we do in this parliament, we do it in accordance with the Constitution and the law of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. So, Madam President, I wanted to also ask the Attorney General, did the Attorney General consult, Madam President, with the judges in the courts of Trinidad and Tobago before he brought this here? Did the Attorney General, Madam President, discuss this matter and seek the advice of the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago before he brought this matter here? Did the Attorney General discuss this matter with the Salaries Review Commission before it was brought here? Did the Attorney General meet with the Chief Personnel Officer to discuss this matter before it was brought here? Where did this come from? Madam President, in closing, let me tell you, we believe in the rule of law. And we must have an independent judiciary in this country. And the, the, the perception must never be given that the executive arm of the state is trying to curry favor with the judiciary. I'm not saying they are doing it, Madam President, but they must never give the impression to the country that they are seeking to curry favor with the judiciary. That is dangerous for our health in terms of democracy and the values that we adhere to. This is not a simple matter, no, Madam President. This is a very serious matter that we are dealing with. The lives of our citizens in the next 20 years will be dependent on what we do Senator Mark, today. your time is up. Thank you very Attorney much, Madam General. President. Madam President, that was sheer torture, yeah. Madam President. Intellectual torture at its highest. Not only was the volume obscenely loud in the contribution of my learned friend, but it appears that Senator Mark is not a member of any caucus in his own opposition. Senator Hussein, Senator Sobers, and the leader of the opposition, one Kamla Prasad Bisesa of senior counsel, all apparently share a different point of view to Senator Mark. We had to listen to Senator Mark this evening. I'd really hope to just stand and say I, the usual words by which one ends a debate, but I'm compelled to unfortunately go down the tunnel and fabric of deceit that was just put to us in the intellectual construct that was just mentioned in this honorable Attorney Senate. Attorney General. Attorney General, Attorney General yes. Can you just withdraw and refreeze? your presentation. Sure. Madam President, I withdraw. I will rephrase the intellectual argument put before me in the following terms. Absurd, nonsensical, lacking in preparation, no form of reflective consideration amongst colleagues in the opposition, and pure intellectual torture, Madam President. I hope I've done better justice at characterizing the argument of Senator Mark. Madam President, let's get to where Senator Mark is in the ridiculous submissions put on the floor of the Senate today. Senator Mark's submission, not made by senior counsel, the leader of the opposition, not made by Senator Hussein, not made by Senator Sobers, both of whom seemed to be hanging their heads in shame while he spoke, had, Madam President, an underwriting that we are somehow requiring this Senate to consider a three-quarters majority. Senator Mark seeks to hang that argument on the back of Section 54 of the Constitution, which sets out the degree of entrenchment for legislation. Section 54 of the Constitution properly says the method by which you amend certain aspects of the Constitution. We know that Section 4 and 5 rights require a three-fifths majority, so says Section 13 of the Constitution. 
Section 54 of the Constitution says that you either require a two-thirds majority with respect to the matters set out at Section 54.2 of the Constitution, or a three-quarters majority with respect to the matters set out at Section 54.3 of the Constitution. And with respect to the terms and conditions of judges, that entrenchment is at two-thirds if you're going to adopt any measure of interrupting terms and conditions set out in sections 133 to 137 of the Constitution. So let's deal with that. Let me break this down through you, Madam President, to the average listener. Senator Mark says that this government is breaching the Constitution. Senator Mark says that the opposition wishes to support the move in retirement age from 65 to 70, but his allegation is that we require three quarters of the support of this House to treat with that. So let's deal with the law. Section 106 of the Constitution says, and we're dealing with the judicial age for retirement. 106 of the Constitution says, subject to Section 1043, a judge shall hold office in accordance with Sections 136 and 137. Section 136 of the Constitution says, Madam President, the holder of an office to which this subsection and subsections 3 to 11 apply, in this section referred to as the officer, shall vacate his office on attaining the age of 65 years or such other age as may be prescribed. Senator Hussein stood here a short while ago and said he understands the simplicity of this bill. He himself referred to section 136.1 and then went on to chapter 101 of the laws of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, which is the chapter that treats with 102 of the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. Constitution Prescribed Matters Act. Senator Hussein just said it. It's true that we are practicing social distancing in this parliament, and Senator Hussein is now slightly further away from Senator Mark. But Madam President, we have the luxury of an audio system in here. And Madam President, the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act is very clear. The Constitution Prescribed Matters Act has in it, listen to this section four. The age at which the Auditor General is required to vacate his office under Section 136.1 of the Constitution is 60 years. Let me explain why I've just referred to that. Section 136.1 of the Constitution speaks to the holder of an office, and the Auditor General is in there. And generally, we say 65 unless otherwise prescribed, but the prescribed aspects coming in the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, it makes an exception and puts the Auditor General at 60 years. In other words, then, this is living proof that the manner in which you prescribe the age of an office holder is by virtue of an amendment to the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act. And it is ridiculous to have been subjected to the paucity of research and the flight of fantasy that Senator Mark engaged in, to come here and say that you need to go and amend the Constitution, Section 136, by a three-quarters majority, when it doesn't even say that, because it actually says two-thirds majority in the Constitution if you read it. But Senator Mark jumped to the three-quarters majority, which does not apply, and I took careful notes, Madam President. And Madam President, when you listen to the ridiculousness of the argument coming from Senator Mark, it is made clear by the very provisions of Chapter 102 that the manner in which you prescribe the age set out clearly in Section 136.1, which says 
age of 65 years or such other age as may be prescribed, written in the English language, in bold text, is by virtue of an amendment to the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act. Madam President, I feel a deep sense of torture on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago to have to listen to Senator Mark put these submissions on the record. So Madam President, let me just categorically reject out of hand the nonsense of that argument. It is ridiculous, quite simply put, Madam President. Madam President, we are creating in the Judicial and Legal Services Act a classification of persons now to be called chief judicial officers. We are simply saying that the chief judicial officers, as now defined in this bill, and we see it at clause four of the bill, the chief judicial officer means master of the high court, chief magistrate, registrar, and marshal of the high court. And we are adding in the court executive administrator. Madam President, I don't know where Senator Mark was when he was the minister of public administration. Let me repeat this. I don't know where Senator Mark was when he himself was the Minister of Public Administration, but in 1998, by way of cabinet note, let me repeat this, in 1998, by way of cabinet note, we created the Office of Executive Court Administrator. Am I making that up? Madam President, look to the Judicial and Legal Services Act, Chapter 601. Turn to the schedule to that act. Look at Part 3 of the second schedule. In black and white, you will see the following words at the middle of the page. Part 3, Court Executive Administrator. Senator Mark received remuneration from the taxpayers of this country as the Minister of Public Administration had responsibility for managing entities like the Chief Personnel Officer, interacted with the public service, and comes here today in 2020 to hold up a straw man and knock it down, shamelessly unaware that the office was created since 1998 and features here, Madam President, Part three, second schedule, judicial offices. Further for the record, the office was created as a contract position. Further for the record, the current holder of that office, Michelle Austin, was appointed as a judge of the industrial court, fully and properly so, that Departure on grounds of public service to serve as a judge of the industrial court is in gear and therefore the office is vacant and can be filled. Master Christiane Morris Allen, who has given her soul and lifeblood to this country, currently holds that position. She was the court executive administrator under Michael de Labastide, Queen's Council who birthed the civil proceedings reforms carrying it forward by Chief Justice Sharma. These are icons in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. And I take umbrage to Senator Mark pouring scorn on the work of people who currently hold that office. And let me tell you this, the scandal put forward today is the ridiculous submission that the government is currying favor with the judiciary. For heaven's sake, a parliament passing a material benefit for office holders, as we do from year to year, when we have taxation benefits, etc., as we did in 2013, when the SRC 98 report was brought and laid in this parliament, did the PNM stand up in 2013 and say the SRC report, the 98 report, was to curry favor with the judiciary? 
Madam President, that is a ridiculous submission. It is an obscenity to put forward an argument like that. And Madam President, what's the end result of what we see in here? There's an objection to the court executive administrator, the master, the chief magistrate, etc., retiring at 65? Really? Didn't Senator Hussein just stand up here and read quite correctly from the reflections in the UK experience where they made a recommendation that you have a graduated scale in respect of retirement ages? Didn't Senator Hussein just do that and commend it to all of us to read? Should he perhaps have commended Senator Mark to read it? Is it that Senator Hussein and Senator Mark don't speak to each other? To watch the submissions coming and the heads hanging in shame while Senator Marx speaks is, is torture, Madam President. Madam President, when we look to the provisions of having the holding of office, it comes back to the piloting. We want the criminal justice system to work we want people to stay in the position and not be attracted elsewhere. The management of the judiciary is a critical aspect for the functioning of the judiciary. Was Senator Mark present when we did the Family and Children Division Bill? Was Senator Mark present when we did the Criminal Division Bill? And we entrenched the operation of the court executive administrator and deputy court executive administrators to say justice must run with HR talent. Surely Senator Sipasad, who has an insight into management of a law firm, for instance, would appreciate the need to manage the judiciary. Surely honorable senators in their individual experiences, Senator Vera, as he reflected upon the Delabastid icon that he is, understands the benefit in having human resources. That's what we're talking about. Human resources. Let's deal with the further aspect of gross, unadulterated, unbridled ridiculousness of submission coming from Senator Mark. Let's turn to section 141 of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Senator Mark, in a shrill tone, recommended to this parliament that somehow the SRC is the be all and end all, and the terms and conditions have to be the SRC's position. Madam President, here's what section 141 says. The Salaries Review Commission shall, from time to time, with the approval of the President, review the salaries and other conditions of service of the President, the holders of offices referred to in Section 136.12.215, not 136.1, eh? which we are amending by prescription. But Senators Mark forgot to tell us it's Sections 136.12-15. Members of Parliament, including Ministers of Government and Parliamentary Secretaries, and the holders of such other offices as may be prescribed. Subsection 2. The report of the SRC concerning any review of salaries or other conditions of service, or both, shall be submitted to the President, who shall forward a copy thereof to the Prime Minister for presentation to the Cabinet and for laying as soon as possible thereafter on the table of each house. What does that mean? The SRC conducts an exercise, they do a review, they take a report triggered by the cabinet, because president under section 80 of the constitution means the cabinet. So the cabinet tells the SRC to conduct a review, the SRC produces a report, they give it to the prime minister, and here are the words, Madam President, for presentation to the cabinet. You know what that means? The cabinet could reject it, amend it, adopt it, manage it. And in fact, Madam President, I don't know where Senator Mark was in 2013 when the SRC's 98th report was laid in this parliament. What happens is 
the government deals with the adoption of aspects of the report by way of a positive statement of what it accepts or rejects. Senator Mark perhaps does not remember the SRC recommended to remove everybody inside of here who enjoys a benefit for taxation, relief for their motor vehicle and, and cars, to reduce that. <coughs> Senator Mark probably forgot. Why was that not accepted? Because it would have been a derogation from a benefit which honorable members were receiving and therefore had to be rejected. So if you accept Senator Mark's ridiculous submission, that the SRC report effectively is a fait accompli, meaning it's a done deal, then why, why was that not accepted in 2013 when he sat as the Speaker of the Parliament? <laughs> Madam President, why, why was that not accepted? Why did Senator Mark not reflect upon surely something he must have gleaned in his stint as the Minister of Public Admin? that it is the Minister of Finance that operationalizes the SRC report by way of financial instructions through the Ministry of Finance. You see, the ridiculousness in the argument is to pretend Attorney that... Attorney General, if I may, you have been presenting for quite some time, and there are certain words that you keep repeating. I'll ask you now to just move on in your presentation with all, without all those adjectives, okay? Madam President, I don't mean to be pejorative. I certainly don't want to put on the record that I'm not referring, referring to a character or a personality. I'm characterizing an argument. I will take your guidance and I will soften the language on that approach. I think the point has been made. I'm characterizing an argument. I'll do so in slightly different language. Madam President, the, the offense to intellect in making the submission that section 141 of the, of the Constitution, which is the SRC position, that that is somehow the only method by which terms and conditions can be improved, is to belie the very formula inside of section 141, which says that the cabinet ultimately makes its own decisions. And in answer to Senator Mark's position as to what was the genesis of this reform, the genesis, as I've said, and I can say now, we did consult the CPO. We did, I certainly had consultations with members of the Law Association. I certainly did, as Attorney General, speak with the judiciary, the higher and lower judiciary, the registrars, etc., in general discussion. The cabinet considered the position. And Madam President, we made inquiries of the SRC as to whether they had actually completed the exercise, and the SRC said they now start, because they had to restart, and maybe check us in another five to six years' time. That being the case, recognizing that the HR, the human resources of the judiciary are at risk, the cabinet took the decision, as it is entitled to do, in similar terms to an SRC report presented to it by the President under Section 141, the Cabinet took the decision to amend for the advantage of office holders, not the disadvantage, and therefore not derogating from terms and conditions, and advantage is always to be accepted. We approved the terms and conditions to a better state and condition, harmonizing the salary range for the respective office holders, court executive administrator, master, registrar, chief magistrate, to the terms and conditions associated with the Chief Parliamentary Council, the DPP, and the Solicitor General. That, therefore, underwrites, in a proper sense, the logic and consistency of approach. Number one, to maintain human resources. Number two, to harmonize the ages of certain office holders. Number three, to take a tiered approach. A, judges at 70, B, certain critical office holders at 65, now harmonized with chief legal officers who are at 65, and C, as I answered in respect of Senator Sobers' inquiry, and I want to say that Senator Sobers presented a sensible argument here today, I answered the step as to what we are doing about the magistracy next, so we've only managed the chief magistrate at this point. Let's deal with Senator Hussein's inquiries as to the proximity of the chief executive administrator to 
the Chief Justice. Senator Hussein made a submission which was based upon, premised upon, what I think is a mistaken view of what we're doing. Senator Hussein said, and I wrote it down, that we are now putting the Chief Executive Administrator under the Chief Justice. Just for the record, we're not now doing that. That was done in 1998. It's in the second schedule, part three, the Executive Court Administrator. That's point one. Two, the Executive Court Administrator is the Revenue Officer under the Exchequer and Audit Act, who acts, therefore, exactly as a permanent secretary does to a minister. The second premise, which was unfortunate in Senator Hussein's submission, is that the proximity of the court executive administrator to the Chief Justice is somehow different to that of a permanent secretary to a minister. Let me just correct that. That is not the case. The underwriting for that argument the support for that argument is to be found in Section 79 of the Constitution. Section 79 of the Constitution says, subsection 2, where a minister, sorry, subsection 1, the president acting in accordance with the advice of the prime minister may by directions in writing assign to the prime minister or any other minister responsibility for any business of the government of Trinidad and Tobago and here are the words, including the administration of any department of government. What does that mean? The minister can give the permanent secretary instructions. So what on earth could be wrong with the chief justice qua minister giving the court executive administrator that has the exact form and function as a permanent secretary instructions? What could be wrong with that? particularly in the face of Section 99 of the Constitution. What is Section 99 of the Constitution? In Chapter 7 of the Constitution, the separation of powers argument. Imagine the difficulty you would be in if the Chief Justice didn't have control of the Chief Justice's permanent secretary, so-called the Court Executive Administrator. And instead, the Attorney General who is the coordinating minister with responsibility for the judiciary, gave that PS instructions. What, what would we do to the separation of powers? Wouldn't that offend the separation of powers in and of itself? So, Madam President, number one, I reject out of hand, as stridently as one can possibly do, the submissions coming from Senator Mark. They are flight of fantasy, laced with conspiracy, none of which have any form of merit. Secondly, I reject the arguments coming from Senator Hussein in less strident fashion. I believe that the observations made by the Honorable Senator were premised on two false premises. That is, that there is something wrong with the Chief Justice managing the Court Executive Administrator and that somehow that was being done now. That was done in 1998. And I want to remind the UNC had a certain turn at the wheel in its time in government and certainly didn't care to do anything about it. So why come today to invent an argument that we need a three quarters majority, two thirds majority, SRC is the only entity that could do it, and that there's something wrong with the proximity between the Chief Justice and the Court Executive Administrator. That's just wrong. That's just plain wrong. Madam President, I, I regret that I had to answer those arguments. It was dangerous to leave them without answer on the record. I had really hoped to be extremely short in this wind-up. There is one small amendment that we propose at committee stage, and that is quite simply, Madam President, with respect to Clause 4, to instead of using the words the Registrar and Marshal of the High Court, it really is not the High Court only, it's the Supreme Court that we're looking at. So we propose one small amendment to close four of the bill, if it should please the honorable members at committee stage. In those circumstances, Madam President, I beg to move. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled an act to amend the Constitution, Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, 
the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judicial and Legal Service Act, Chapter 601, be now read a second time. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A, a, a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapters 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judi Judicial and Legal Service Act, Chapter 601. Attorney General. Madam President, in accordance with Standing Order 66-1, I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judicial and Legal Services Act, Chapter 601, be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered close by close. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judicial and Legal Service Act, Chapter 601, be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered close by close. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The Senate shall now go into committee of the whole to consider the bill close by close. Clauses 1 to 3. Honourable Senators, the question is that clauses 1 to 3 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 1 to 3 now stand part of the bill. Clause 4. The question is that clause 4 stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Should it please you, Madam President, we have circulated an amendment to Clause 4. Effectively, it is just nomenclature, and it is as circulated, changing the Registrar and Marshal of the High Court to Registrar and Marshal, as that is the correct term. The, the question is that Clause 4 be amended as circulated. Senator Hussein. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I just want to find out, I know we are amending 4A. Can I um, raise some issues with respect to 4B? Sure. Um, Attorney General, I know this was the last point you made in the winding up with respect to the supervision of the court executive administrator who falls under part three of the second schedule and also the administrative secretary to the chief justice. If we're going to define chief judicial officer to include court executive administrator and you're amending 151A to now insert the word chief judicial officer, are we now making it duplicitous because you would have the chief executive administrator being part of 151A and also part of 151B3? I don't think that we're making it duplicitous. I think we're, your question is whether we're making a duplication, Duplication, right? sorry. Okay, so that's one. So what we're doing is because we've defined the term in A, so we're saying subject to the Constitution, any written law, control, and supervision may be exercised over A, this category of people, and we're putting the chief judicial officers to capture those who were previously in A, and we're adding the court executive administrator. Yes. I think your question here now, other judicial officers mentioned in, when we get to part three. three, in part three by the Chief Justice. So here is potentially. 
it's a duplication. An issue. So just let me double check with the sure. CPC's team as to whether we may want to adjust that. Madam Chair, may I thank Senator Hussein for his sharp eyes on this point. It is in fact a duplication. I thank the Honourable Senator for noticing that. And in those circumstances, Madam President, if I may indulge you with that gratitude expressed to include as a further amendment to Section 4. So what we have circulated would be for paragraph E. We put in a paragraph B, which would say, and if you'd indulge me, are you ready? It'll be in part three, that's Roman three, of the second schedule, delete the words open commas, court, executive, administrator, close quotations, full stop. Is that okay? Much obliged and with thanks to Senator Hussein. Did you, did you check to see if anywhere else any bill it will be affected? Sorry, any parent act? No, the, that in fact, when I looked for the act and trying to find the genesis of the court executive administrator, that cabinet note amended the schedule and the only place the court executive administrator was put was in that second schedule and then we in the family and children division and criminal division implemented the deputies, the court executive administrator and the deputies in those laws. Thank you, Senator. General, if I could just clarify, yes, the words that you just called out, will that be a subsection C? Uh, yes, it should be. Should be? Yeah, so new subsection C. Yeah, well, just a subsection. Yeah, subsection C. So insert, thank you, Madam, yeah. Madam Chair, so it'll be insert. Yes? One moment, please, Madam Chair.
Madam Chair, if I may, through you, um, my shoulder has been tugged, sleeve tugged, foot kicked by the um, CPC's um, able assistant, Mr. Milton Sorzano, and he said that he's fearful, and I wish to repeat it here, that if we move the reference to CEA Court Executive Administrator in the third part, that we may inadvertently trip the establishment of the office pursuant to the springboard of Section 3. So his recommendation is, even though on the face of it, and I certainly agree with what Senator Hussein had put forward, that it may be a duplication insofar as there is a benefit to be had by maintaining it, that we should instead maintain it. But I do thank Senator Hussein for making that recommendation um, and spotting it. Senator Hussein. Thank you. Just two observations, and I, I, was going, I was going to raise this issue with you, AG, because Section 16 of the Parent Act prescribes the manner in which the first and second schedule are to be amended. That's one. And two, is it possible then that at 515B3, if we delete the words in part three and just insert the words the administrative secretary to the chief justice, Understood. So that's what I was referring to, Madam Chair, in answer to the Honourable Senator. When we look at how Part 3, the offices, were created. So that's where we turn to Section 3. And Section 3 of the Parent Act, there is hereby established the J Judicial and Legal Service. Asterisk in subclause 2, the public offices in the public service set out in the first and second schedules shall be deemed to constitute the judicial and legal services. So it's from that springboard, 3 subsection 2, that the CPC's department is cautioning me, don't inadvertently throw the baby out with the bathwater, when on the face of it, we all agree that there appears to be potentially a duplication. So for those reasons, I'd like to leave it as it is. But I certainly think that the observation was a genuine one, and I thank the Honorable Senator. So may I retreat from the recommendation and simply stick with that which was circulated? Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 4 be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. Thanks, Mr. I think the ayes have it. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 4 as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 4 as amended now stands part of the bill. That's it. Honourable Senators, the question is that the bill as amended be now reported to the Senate. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The bill as amended will now be reported to the Senate. Attorney General. Madam President, I wish to report that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judicial and Legal Services Act, Chapter 601, was considered in Committee of the Whole and approved with amendments. I now beg to move that the Senate agree with the Committee's report. Honourable Senators, the question is that this Senate agree with the Committee's report on a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judicial and Legal Service Act, Chapter 601. Those in favour say aye. 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 Those against say no. I think the ayes have it, Attorney General. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judicial and Legal Services Act, Chapter 601, be read a third time and passed. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, and the Judicial and Legal Service Act, Chapter 601, be now read a third time and passed. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled, An Act to Amend the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 102, the Interpretation Act, Chapter 301, 
and the Judicial and Legal Service Act, Chapter 601. Acting Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I beg to move that this House be adjourned to Tuesday, 24th March, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. That is Private Members' Day, Madam President. Acting Leader of Government Business. Madam President, as I said before, I beg to move that this House be adjourned to Tuesday, 24th March 2020 at 1.30 p.m. On that day, it's Private Members' Day. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do now adjourn to Tuesday, the 24th of March 2020 at 1.30 p.m. Those in favor say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. This Senate now stands adjourned to Tuesday the 24th of March 2020 at 1.30 p.m.